All right, well, our next speaker is Dr. Jim Martin from the University of Kentucky. He's in the Plant and Soil Sciences Department. He actually joins us from Princeton at the University of Kentucky Research and Education Center. And he will be speaking with us today about herbicide resistant weeds. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, I appreciate the invite, Sarah. Good morning, folks. Uh, is it, I'm okay in the back. Can, is this reasonable? And I don't want to scream and hurt your all's ears, but if this is suitable with everybody, I'll try to. And if you can't hear me and I get to wandering around, just yell at me and we'll try to make it a little more clear for you. Uh, <clears throat> Sarah asked me to talk with this group, and I'm trying to figure out what sort of things might be helpful to you. And there's a pretty large, diverse group here in terms of what your interests are. I work in row crop agriculture, corn, soybeans, I deal with uh, weed control and wheat. And if you deal with that area, some of this stuff that I'm going to tell you is probably going to be a little bit of a rerun for you because this is the heart of a lot of my grain talks. But some of the things that I deal with in these herbicide resistant weeds, I think will we'll kind of relate to a number of you even though you may not work traditionally in grain crops, okay? Hopefully there'll be some things out of this that'll make it worth your while. Let me uh, sort of start off by saying herbicide resistant weeds is kind of a big issue and for us in the row crop agriculture it is increasingly important issue. Uh, there's up to about 2012, uh, 327 resistant biotypes were identified. That number is bigger than that now. Just couldn't uh, get on the web to get the numbers current. But at that time, that's a lot of herbicide resistant weeds globally in terms of what's been identified. It's, it's related to 200 species. 116 of those are dicots or broadleaf weeds. In 80, 84 were monocots. Monocots are the grasses, the sedges, the lilies, like wild garlic, for example. So they're fairly close in terms of the types of uh, weeds that are out there. Over 500,000 fields are impacted. And while that uh, doesn't sound like a lot, some of those fields are really, really impacted by some of these weeds. I want to clarify, what, what is a herbicide resistant <coughs> weed? This, while this is probably elementary to some of you, uh, it sometimes gets confusing for others. And I'll point out a couple of situations where it can be confusing. It's really the uh, inherited ability, the key to it, it's inherited ability in the plant to survive and reproduce following an exposure to a dose of herbicide or rate of herbicide that would normally be lethal to the wild type. The wild type being the one that's out there in large numbers in the abundance and the ones that we think of as being the native population. In amongst that native population, there are, in many cases, a few outlaws, if you will. The ones that don't read the book, that they're the ones that are going to be the pest. But to be honest about it, when we spray, and over the years, we've sprayed numbers of fields with herbicides, they just hide under the radar. It's a few weeds will escape, and to be honest about it, when we spray herbicide, you know, our expectations are we're going to get 100% weed control. But in reality, that's, that's almost impossible. Herbicides rarely give you 100% weed control. You'll have a few escapes. And when those escapes occur, you see them in the field, and you just think, ah, you just write it off as that plant was, hadn't been emerged at the time, or he was hiding under the canopy, which sometimes may be a legitimate excuse. But really, some of these are hiding under the radar. They're just there, but they don't really grow in large numbers because there's so many other weeds out there that are competing against them that they don't express themselves. And they don't, and they escape when we're using what we call that normal dose of herbicide that's supposedly going to kill or control it. But if we take a repeated use of a herbicide or a class of herbicides that are very similar in their activity, with the, or the same mode of activity, we're putting what we call a selection pressure. We're selecting out plants that are, are going to escape that treatment that we applied. Okay? The treatment, it may be a plant that escapes it because he is herbicide resistant and truly resistant. Or it may be that it's just a species that wasn't going to be controlled without herbicide anyway. 
okay? And if we continue to use that herbicide in that environment and continue to spray it, and we don't use other herbicides to help combat whatever it is that's escaping, those plants are gonna become the dominant part of the population. We're just selecting out, okay? It may be a truly resistant weed, or it may be a weed that just was not gonna be controlled by it. And a good example of the second one here is when we spray Roundup, and those who deal with real crop agriculture know that Roundup or glyphosate, unbelievably good on grasses. Yellow nut sheds may be one of those it's pretty weak on, okay? And we spray glyphosate on those situations and it doesn't control it, next thing you know, in these so-called wet areas where it was just a very little bit of nut sedge, Roundup expressed itself and selected for nut sedge. Now, if you use high enough rates, you can kill nut sedge, okay? Same way with morning glories. Uh, pitted morning glory is a good example in the, real, in the grain crops. It's got some degree of tolerance to glyphosate, okay? Now, you use enough of glyphosate, you will control it, but, and even in within the labeled rates of glyphosate, but you're selecting out those weeds that are what I call somewhat marginally susceptible, okay? Then they become the dominant part of the population, okay? How fast does it happen? I'm gonna pick an example, just throw a number out. Let's say we have, back in 2010, one plant that produces, and capable of producing 8,000 seed. Now, you know, 8,000 seed is not very much for some weeds. Some of the pig weeds that we deal with produce over half a million seed. Uh, Mayor still, if you're familiar with it, it can produce as much as 280,000 seed. But we're gonna take this example and we're gonna be a little bit on the conservative side here so we just don't blow you out of the water. This plant produces 8,000 seed, okay? He's an escapee. He escapes the control, he produces 8,000 seed, the seed fall to the soil. Next year, 20% of those seed that fall to the soil are capable of germinating. The other 80% were either eaten up by insects or they just lay dormant in the soil and they're just hanging around there, okay? But they don't express themselves or they don't germinate. So 20%, and that's a pretty conservative number. 20% of those seed germinate in the plants. So if you take 20% of 8,000, that's 1,600 plants come 2011. Those 16, excuse me, 1,600 plants, those 1,600, each of those produce 8,000 seed. At the end of the year, they produce 12,800,000. Okay, that's one plant going from year one to year two. 12 million. Now we're going to take that 12 million and let them exist another year, go through that same cycle, and we come down here at 20 trillion, assuming I, my math is correct, and I'm, I don't know about these big numbers. I'm learning more about them with the national debt, but <laughs> 20 million, 480 billion. Okay, those are big numbers. Okay, over a period of three years, he went from one plant to over 20 trillion, okay? That's pretty impressive. Uh, doesn't take long. You know, some fields that I've observed, and some of you have been in this room to deal with, again, I'll go back to the real crop agriculture, pigweeds, the water hemp, the palmer that we deal with. How long does it take for those to express themselves? Probably about four or five years under normal circumstances, you go from just a one or two plants, to the next thing you know, it may be a robust population out there. I'll say three to five years, okay? You can take that situation, but now on another environment where these weeds can survive and spread is with floods. The floods in 2010 and 2011 in West Kentucky, where the High River got out of its banks, the Mississippi River got out of its banks, backwaters occurred, got into some fields that we hadn't seen there for years. And when those backwaters receded, they deposited whatever was in them. And, you know, I've heard dealers say, that, you know, they're going out to a field and they can look for what weeds were there and they could see a line around the edge of the field where that high water mark was, is where water hemp became a problem. And it went from just a no problem to a very significant problem overnight. So in those kind of environments, it just, it just happens just like that. 
Whereas these other situations where you don't have the floods to help you along, you just kind of letting it naturally build up, that uh, it's gonna take a few, it may not happen overnight. I'm gonna pick out uh, a few different classes of herbicides and talk about the history and how they developed resistance. This, uh, this group of chemistry, I call it the ALS chemistry. It's, it's a specific enzyme, acetolactate synthase. And again, don't get hung up on names of enzymes and those kind of things. It's just, it's an enzyme in plants that produces certain amino acids that plants produce, but don't impact us as humans or animals, okay? It's real safe chemistry. If you're familiar with it, classic, what we use in soybeans, or accent that we use in corn, or scepter in pursuit that we use in soybeans, that chemistry is, belongs to what we call the ALS inhibitors. They inhibit this specific enzyme. Okay, first introduced in 1982. Uh, the first incidents of resistance showed up out in the Great Plains where they were produced wheat, and then their rotation is, their rotation is just wheat, wheat, and wheat. There is no rotational crops. They uh, don't have a rotation for wheat. And they were using glean, and unbelievably impressed with what glean would do in terms of weed control. Very, very impressive. And so, over a period of two years, those fields where they were cleaning them up, all of a sudden, lo and behold, they started seeing resistance show up. And it only took two years from the time that chemistry was commercially introduced until you start seeing resistance show up. Uh, now there's over 107, 000, or 107 weeds. Actually, that number, this is an old graph. It's, it's probably more than 107. If you look in amongst the other groups, th that's a lot. That's a lot, okay? What it's telling me is that that group of chemistry is prone to developing resistance. So if you're using it, you know what? Yeah, well, it's great. And, uh, and for us in Kentucky, for you guys that deal with corn and soybeans, you can remember the days before we had scepters and the pursuits and the classics. It was tough handle. It was tough growing a crop. And that chemistry came on board in the mid 80s and it, it, it just was unbelievable how it helped us in weed control. But we were using other herbicides during that introduction and that helped us, okay, over, you know, it, it helped us limit the spread of this stuff and developing resistance because we're using different rotations and different chemistries. So it's not showing up in Kentucky in large numbers as it is in some other states where they use these things year after year after year, okay? Two years. The ACC ACE inhibitors, which a lot of you are familiar with, Fusilide, Select Max, Authority, Whip, Option. There's uh, a number of what I call the post grass herbicides, strictly post, post grass herbicides. First introduced in 1975, it took seven years for it to develop resistance to that, that chemistry. 39 weedy biotypes have been confirmed with that resistance. Well, that's not a lot, that's a pretty significant number. <coughs> the photosystem 2 inhibitors are atrazine, princep, or metribuzin. Uh, they inhibit photosynthesis on a specific uh, enzyme. It first showed up in 1958, and some of you guys around here, and I was just a very young kid at this time, was really impressed. It's one of the first corn herbicides I used, we used on my father's farm. Really impressed with what atrazine can do. Showed up in 1958, first developed resistance in 1970, so that's took 12 years or 68. Quite a few of those plants are resistant out there, okay? Then we get down here to this one on the bottom end. The, the product is called Roundup, obviously glyphosate, inhibits this EPSP enzyme, okay? Again, we don't worry about the name of the enzyme, it's just, it inhibits this enzyme. Glyphosate was introduced in 1975, some of y'all can remember that. It, again, was one of those situations where it helped us tremendously in grain crops, control Johnson grass, and allowed us to go into no-till soybeans in some areas. First resistance showed up in 1996. It took 21 years to develop. And over that 21 years, 21 resistant biotypes, actually there's 24, I'll show you the list in a minute. 21, it's a pretty large number. What, what's the deal here? Monsanto, when Roundup Ready Beans came out, there wasn't any resistant weeds to known to glyphosate at the time. And the real concern was, 
you know, as us as weed scientists, you know, there's some naysayers that say, hey, you know what? You're going, you're going to mess around with this thing. You're going to get resistance if you're not careful. And Monsanto's claim was, it's not going to happen. Okay? It's not going to happen. Well, guess what? It did happen. But if I was in, I, if I'm in Monsanto's shoes at the time, I would have been saying the same thing. Because if you look at, because all you have is what you have in front of you in terms of your experience, and your experience says, it didn't show up over 21 years. And we sprayed it on a lot of acres, okay? Nothing to the magnitude that what we were spraying it when we got the Roundup Ready crops, but we sprayed it on a lot of acres. And not an iota sign of resistance. The first resistance showed up was not in row crops, it was in, in the orchards over in Oregon. 21 years. So how do we explain the fact that in today's world, when we talk about herbicide resistant weeds, we talk about glyphosate. These others, oh, they're there, but you know, for the most part, they're not on the radar like glyphosate is. Glyphosate's on the radar big time. So what's the deal? Why did that happen? It's because we were putting a huge amount of selective pressure. Once the Roundup Ready crops like corn, or excuse me, soybeans came on about 1995, and it's a few short years later, Roundup Ready corn came on. Corn, soybeans, growing them in a rotation. Next thing you know, we're using Roundup after Roundup after Roundup. Roundup in the burn down, Roundup in the crop. If it didn't control it the first time in the crop, spray it again in the crop. We may spray it three times, sometimes four times. So we're spraying those fields and basically what we, we're doing is we're putting a huge amount of sol what we call selection pressure on that population. And I use the analogy here is we're, we're turning over rocks. Okay, those resistant ones that are out there, and there's, they're, they're hiding, they're hiding under rocks, but we're overturning those rocks, and we're a huge amount of selection pressure with that system with using the Roundup Ready crops. And because of that, if we put the same amount of selection pressure with the ALS and the enzymes, well, we'd have been out of business, because that chemistry, well, we'd just get need up with, with resistance. But that's why this thing has gotten on board because we use so much of this is in um, selection pressure and just widespread use of the products. This is, this is kind of a graphically shows you the, the, the numbers of biotypes that showed up over, uh, over uh, since we started using herbicides. And remember I talked about the ALS inhibitors? Look, here, they're, they're the king of the pile. And they happened over just a very short period of time. And I'll have to say, in Kentucky, we were, we were probably this close for that resistance to get a hold of us and do a pretty good job on us. But the thing that rescued us was the Roundup Ready technology. Because about 19, in, the, in 1990, we started seeing ALS resistant smooth pigweed. And then we started seeing water hemp in, in some very isolated cases. And in a matter of just a few short years after that, those things, that type of resistance was gone, vaporized. Didn't, didn't show up on the scene anymore because Roundup Ready technology took care of it. It eliminated that, that resistance, okay? Uh, glycine, glyphosate right here. And that thing, it's kind of tapered off here in the last few years, but it, it was kind of going at a steady pace of about one, one species a year, you know. Occasionally, another one will pop up. This is uh, the, chronologically, if you go from the very first uh, population that showed up was in rigid ryegrass. I'm gonna have an opportunity to talk about ryegrass here in a little bit later. 1996 was the very first to show up, and that was in orchards. Remember when I talked about orchards? It wasn't in the Roundup Ready crops. But when they came on with the Roundup Ready crops in 1995, yeah, you know, they start building up. It starts accumulating in lots of different weeds. Here in Kentucky right now, we know mare's tail resistance to glyphosate resistance, common ragweed in and around the Davies County area, Palmer or Palmer amaranth uh, throughout very significant parts of western Kentucky, especially on the rivers, common water hemp likewise. Those, those are the ones highlighted or asterisks in the red are the ones that we have in Kentucky. Um, and all these others are showing that uh, we know of resistance that shows up with them.
the, uh, the one that I think is on the horizon that really concerns me is, uh, is glyphosate resistant Johnson grass because if we get that, that's again some of you more experienced, I'll call them you experienced and not old people, but more experienced people can remember the days when Johnson grass was eating our lunch. And you know, there's some technologies that really saved us on that. But if we get glyphosate resistant Johnson grass, oh, it's going to be a struggle. Uh, we talk about this selection pressure and what sort of just general terms and, and, and there's going to be everything I show up here on these next few slides you're going to find exceptions to. But I, I just say this in general terms, how do we link the selection pressure and where, is our, where are our risks greatest? Weeds, anything that's in a life cycle, the vast majority of plants that have been developing this resistance is uh, plants that are annuals. If they produce lot, logic would tell you, if they produce lots of seed, that's going to get them in the game much quicker. Okay? High percent of those seeds germinate each year, as long as they don't go dormant or the insects don't eat them up. Again, you're selecting, you're just letting that, I'll call, uh, my term is, let the resistance weeds express themselves to their fullest capabilities. So what you're trying to do is get rid of all the roadblocks, get rid of all the other weeds that are out there that are competing with that resistance, and let them germinate, and let them eventually become part of the dominant population. If you look at the herbicide characteristics, if it's a single side of action, you can the, the weeds can break that code much easier if you just if you're s s hitting one site of action inside that plant. If it's multiple sites, all bets are off because you can't you know that weed doesn't have all the combinations to all those sites. Okay, so it takes a pretty good task for it to overcome some of those sites. Okay. High frequency of use, again, I, we're talking about the glyphosate, year after year, it's solely glyphosate. Highly effective on certain weeds, and no doubt glyphosate is probably one of the more uh, effective weeds in controlling large numbers of species. I don't think there's any other herbicide out there that controls the numbers of species like glyphosate will. Now, the one exception, long residual soil activity, where glyphosate had none, you can write that off. But if you use something out there like Pramatol or something that's got some long-term persistence in the soil, basically what it's trying to do is it's going to, anything that germinates, if he's susceptible, you knock him off and he's gone. If he's resistant, he's going to emerge. And if, he, if that herbicide is hanging around in the soil for months and months, I hate to say years because that's generally not the case, but for a long period of time, you're just you're letting you're just kind of cleaning out all the other riffraff and letting the the so-called real resistant weeds express themselves. Cultural practices, lack of crop rotation. This is one thing I'll say for us in Kentucky, um, and I'll mention it again a little bit later. Resistance. Herbicide resistance in Kentucky is not nearly the magnitude of a problem that it is in some of our neighboring states. And it has partly to do with the rotation system that we have. We have three crops two years. That's corn, soybeans, and wheat. And you put those three crops, and that's what you grow year after year. You have a, basically, you're gonna have ground cover, a significant part of that two years that you go through that rotation. There's not very many times that it's going to be bare ground. Yeah, there'll be sometimes. But as a general rule, you're putting a cover on that ground. And when you do that, you're creating competition and you're creating shade. And that helps. That really helps. Another flip side is it? Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Chickweed. Uh, Chickweed, and I'll, I'll show you another. Chickweed is a problem in some parts of Kentucky. Chickweed germinates late fall or early fall throughout the winter, and we can kill it off, but it, it, when we put it in our corn soybean rotation, and we go in with no-till corn, and we spray our, our burn down something like February, March, we're getting rid of chickweed before it produces seed. Now, if we hadn't done that, and we just let the chickweed grow and mature and then show up when we start planting corn, chickweed could very well be a problem. But because we're putting down burn downs, we're eliminating the biggest part of the population before it produces seed. So, yeah, some will produce seed and you'll have a few hanging around there, but it's not a lot. 
Okay, that again, it goes back to this corn rotation, even aside from the fact that we're using different chemicals over that period of two years, we're also culturally, we're doing some things there that nixes that population before it can go to seed. Okay, some of you all work in the tariff industry and I guess everybody in here has a home lawn or has some kind of a lawn that they have to deal with weeds and I'm at the kingpin of having weeds in my, in my neighborhood. Um, annual bluegrass in turf, and yeah, I've got my share of that. Thank God it's not herbicide resistant. But in turf, there have been a few cases where herbicide resistance have been identified. So far, none of this has showed up in Kentucky to my knowledge. But the triazines are the ones that, in fact, this photosystem 2, Princep, they use this in Bermuda grass. <coughs> mostly in the south. We don't mess with that kind of stuff generally here um, in Kentucky, but it was found in, in Mississippi in 1966. Really never manifested itself to any great extent. Uh, the glyphosate resistance, again, it's EPSP enzyme. Annual bluegrass showed up in Missouri in 2010, and I tell you what, it has some of our golf course people shaking in their boots. As you know, man, if we get this stuff, this could be a real nightmare for us. Uh, the, the good news so far is, to my knowledge, it's not in Kentucky. The bad news is it's probably going to get here at some point in time because Tennessee now has it, and we know obviously our guys over Missouri have it as well. So it's just probably going to be a matter of time until something like this shows up. Hate to be in the negative, but that's kind of the, how some of these things tend to unfold. The ALS inhibitors, I talked about that earlier. Uh, image is one of the herbicides that has that activity. Showed up in Alabama with this uh, resistance to uh, annual bluegrass in 2012. The DNAs, they affect this little, when cells divide, it, it's, uh, it doesn't allow them to divide naturally, and so they get these swollen roots at the roof tips. If you're familiar with, with Treflan and so what it'll do with, with, uh, with the roots of uh, susceptible plants. In terms of annual bluegrass, this stuff, DNA do a pretty decent job on annual bluegrass if you get it on at the right time. But that showed up in 2012, not a good deal because we do rely quite a bit on DNAs for managing the weedy grasses and sometimes broadleaf weeds as well. So that's not a good news. Goose grass and turf, yeah, I've got some of that in my home lawn as well. But uh, the DNA resistance, in this case, it was showed up with Treflan, although I think most other DNAs are resistant to it as well, or it's resistant to the other DNAs. Showed up in Georgia in 1992. Uh, and then you got this photosystem too, again, the atrizines. In this case, it was Syncor uh, resistant um, goose grass, showed up in Hawaii in 2003. So let the Hawaii keep that stuff over there. You know, we have a hard enough time trying to control goot right. Is goosegrass one of those that will challenge you some days? Um, even when it's supposed to be susceptible. And the last on my list is, is uh, smooth crabgrass and turf. The ACCAs, the, I call them the post graminicides A claim being one of them here showed up in Georgia in 1992. Um, Smooth crabgrass. Now, now, that's one of the tougher crabgrasses. I don't know what your experience is in, in your line of business, but smooth crabgrass, of all the, the weedy crabgrasses, it's probably a notch tougher to control, even when it's susceptible. Okay, so I tried to get a few examples for those of you in turf. Let me get back to my, my uh, side of the fence to talk a little bit about some of the herbicide resistant weeds as we see in real crops. And some of these, I think, may play a role in your line of business even though you don't deal with corn and soybeans. Mayor's Tail in Kentucky, it's the number one problem weed that we have in terms of numbers of acres and impact of acres. Um, I do this in my grain meetings just to kind of just figure out just are you listening or not? You don't have to tell me, but do you think you know which one of these is Mayor's Tail? Number, you're so brave. Now, did you see my talk last time? <laughs> I think he did. <laughs> so, do you all agree with him? Number one. Yeah, do this. Yeah, number one. It is. All right, do you know what these other two are? Look, <laughs> Look at that. Isn't he clever? <laughs> you studied on this one, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Lucky there, huh? I'm, I'm proud of you. 
uh, annual flea bane. This is, uh, you know, in our line of business, uh, probably these two species are ones that we tend to have the greatest difficulty. And when they're in the really young rosette stage, just emerging, I'm not going to bet my paycheck I can tell the difference. Now, once you get a little bit of growth on them, develop more leaves, this tends to be more. Uh, the amount of pubescence is certainly gr greater, much more significant on this one here. This is pubescent, but it's not nearly as much as this one here. And this one here can get pretty robust in its growth early on, okay? But that's, uh, a, that's enemy number one for us in, in uh, corn, or especially in soybeans. Mayor's tail is, in my estimation, is one of the few weeds, not few weeds, weeds adapt. And this one is excellent at adapting to different environments. Uh, you see this up and down the sidewalks. Winston, does that look familiar? Yeah. We're not going to say where that is, though, right? <laughs> exactly. No. But this, uh, this stuff can grow in amazingly interesting places. Okay? Uh, unfortunately, we've got a few culprits out there that people don't really give a tutti frutti, and they'll let it go to seed, and they let these small lots. They don't mow them, they don't manage them, they just let them. Mother Nature exist the way Mother Nature is supposed to exist, I guess. But they leave these abandoned lots, and they're just chock full of mayor's tail that's starting to produce seed. Okay? Guardrails. <laughs> I ride up and down the road between Lexington and Princeton, and I'm, I tell everybody I'm a boring person. My, my uh, way of occupying time is to count the number of guardrails that have mayor's tail between Lexington and Princeton. Okay? Yeah, it's fairly close. It is fairly close. Um, another guardrail, mayor's tail, and worse yet, we got some Palmer here too. But this this situation here, if you kind of look on behind it, there's a field there that doesn't have any mayor's tail in it right now. But this is probably one of the few weeds. Forget this, the resistance issue. This it's one of the few weeds that we deal with. That crop rotation is not going to have a huge impact on building up that seed bank. Okay, when I say seed bank, weeds produce seed, seed fall to the ground, they get into the soil, it becomes a part of the seed bank. The more weeds you have, the bigger that bank account gets, okay? This thing, you can do all the good crop rotations, and it helps, don't get me wrong, it's, it does help, but you know what? These weeds here stand on that guardrail, the wind's blowing real good this direction here, and whoosh! Or worse yet, you got something like this, and you, you, I don't say it's a fog out there because they're so small you can't really see them, but they're out there floating in the air. Have you all ever seen the seed of this stuff? It's unbelievably small, really small. It's got the little tufts of hair, clusters of hairs. Reminds me of a dandelion seed but unbelievably smaller than a dandelion seed. So small that you almost can't hardly see it floating in the air. And so aerodynamically, this thing, if you get a good gust of wind, it, you can probably blow him a very long distance, okay? I'm telling you, and, and in your line of business, sometimes it's in the home landscape. I know that because I've got some of it in my home landscape. Uh, it does exist there. I want to compare it glyphosate resistance to another group of chemistry that's pretty big on, on mayor's tail, the ALS chemistry. If we have glyphosate resistance out here, and this work was done out of uh, Purdue, where they, they actually compared uh, resistant versus susceptible plants, and the ratio here is, if I were out there spraying a mayor's tail plant, and I know it took a quart of Roundup, I'll use the old, the old Roundup, I don't care, quart of Roundup, and that was my standard rate, and it killed mare's tail over the years, susceptible populations. But now I'm dealing with these resistant guys over here that's emerging. Those resistant guys, it takes to get the same control as that, res that susceptible plant, eight to 39 quarts, okay? So when I say resistance, when you spray it with Roundup with a quart, you know, you do ding him up. You don't kill him, but you ding him up some, and then he regrows. But if you truly want to just do away with him, if you got deep enough pockets and want to break the law, you know, you can spray 39 quarts. Okay? 39 quarts sounds like a lot of Roundup, doesn't it? 
Huh? Let me use this, another similar scenario. ALS resistance, in this case we spray it with Classic, and that's Classic is pretty good on, on, on mare's tail. But we spray Classic at one ounce per acre, right? for simple math here. On the susceptible plants, on the resistant ones, it takes anywhere from 32 to 943 ounces. In other words, when it's resistant, it means it is resistant. You know, it does, it takes a huge amount to get the same response on the susceptible populations. My take home point in here is with glyphosate resistance, and this is kind of pretty typical with most glyphosate resistant weeds, is you see a response. The plants are impacted, and negatively, they, you ding the tops out, and then the mare's tail, you ding the tops out of him, but he survives. Right here, good example. This picture was the very first field that was showed up that I ever saw uh, that had glyphosate resistant mare's tail. And it was in a cornfield, no less. But we did, whoever sprayed this, sprayed it with Roundup and Bicep. They, not, they fried the tops of it or killed the tops, and then they bushed out. And that's sort of the, somewhat the typical response that you'll see with glyphosate resistant mare's tail. Okay? The plant doesn't die, but you take the tops out of him. And the reason for that taking the tops out of him is that glyphosate, the way it kills, especially with mare's tail, it has to translocate and move some. You know, you're familiar with glyphosate, it's capable of moving throughout the plant. But when it comes to resistant populations of mare's tail, they shut that down. That plant shuts that down. It hides it. It hides it. When the glyphosate gets into the plant, it hides it in certain little organelles, if you will, in the cesspool. It hides it because they know this is a bad thing. And so they grab it up, put it in those, those sites, so to speak, and you'll kill the top off, but it won't let it go down to the other parts of the growing points. Okay, that's sort of how it does it. That's how it gets that resistance as a general. There's some other mechanisms too, but that's in general, which why you'll see this kind of response. You just, if you use enough and you've got good spray coverage and all those things, you might see a better response. This is mayor's tail as of 2011 in terms of it in Kentucky. Just about every county that grows soybeans has got mayor's tail in it. Okay. Just about every county. In fact, a lot of those don't have it, I'm sure have it anyway. But what it says is, and this is where it showed up. Let me see, make sure I get my bearings right. This county and Trigg County and Logan County first showed up in 2001. Okay, two, in 2000 year, 2000, uh, yeah, two years later, it showed up in this county. And it may have been in some other counties as well, but I know uh, there are some counties that had this here. So over a period of two years, it was starting to spread in West Kentucky, and now it's just, it's everywhere in West Kentucky. It's everywhere. Enough of this one. Let me uh, go to another species that is a weedy, so he's a good guy and a bad guy, okay? You know what this plant is? I've already given you a hint. Some people like him. Not quite. Say it again. Oh, someone saw my slide before, so I heard a ryegrass. You're good. Whoever else is back here, you want to raise your hand? Look at see. She's good too. The women outdo us guys, you know? They, you know these things. You didn't guess. I know you didn't. Uh, ryegrass. How did you know it was ryegrass? I want you to Yeah, yeah, go. I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were listening. I'll, I'll give you that credit. Uh, ryegrass. All right, let me ask you this. It is a ryegrass. In fact, I'll be so fancy as call it Italian ryegrass. You know, we just, we like to give them real flamboyant names. Is it an annual? Huh? Don't think so. Well, there are two types of ryegrasses that we have in Kentucky. One we call perennial, and the other one we oftentimes in our own slime call it annual. Annual is Italian, okay, okay. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going, to, I'll give you credit. To you, 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 you're really getting close to this. This plant in Kentucky responds as an annual. But there are some references that says, ah, you know, this thing can grow as a biennial or perennial, okay? Uh, 
But in Kentucky, as far as I know, it's, it's, always, it's always an annual plant, okay? Um, cool season, it's got these oracles right here. You know what an oracle is? It's these little claw, I call them cat claws. He just grabs around that, that stem, if you will. These little white structures look like hooks. One coming on this side, one hooking around on that side. Okay, it's got those oracles. Real shiny leaf blade. This is probably one of the few weeds that you can stay in your car. If the sunlight's shining at the right angle, you can sit in your car and say, I know what that weed is. Because it, the sun hits those little shiny undersurface of those leaves and it'll almost blind you. It's real glossy. Gets a real shiny appearance to it. Okay? Many times it'll have purple. I hate to always use this as the acid test because there are exceptions to the rule. It oftentimes will have this purpling color near the soil surface. Okay? Annual ryegrass or Italian ryegrass if you really want to get fancy. Uh, herbicide resistant ryegrasses, and this is again the global perspective. Types of ryegrass, I'll go back to what we typically see in Kentucky is Italian. These numbers over here tells you mechanisms of resistance, meaning different types of herbicides, classes of herbicides. This ryegrass here, Italian ryegrass, is resistant to four different types of herbicides that had just a single site of action. Remember that multiple resistance or multiple sites? It has five of them. When I say multiple, that means you take, it could be just two classes of chemistries, glyphosate and atrazine. Okay, you take those two chemistries and just forget them because they're no longer part of the toolbox because you got that resistance. Okay, so the more resist, if you have multiple resistance, that's not good because that means it takes more tools out of the toolbox that's gonna work for you. Perennial ryegrass kind of follows that same trend. When you deal with perennials, you don't see the resistance developing in as rapidly. Here's the bad culprit, and thank gosh we don't have it in Kentucky. At least I don't think we do. Ridge ryegrass. It does exist in the United States, but it's more in California. Look here, eight types of res uh, classes of chemistries that are resistant to single resistance, and nine that have multiple resistance. If you listen to my good colleagues over in Australia talk about it, this weed is just about paralyzed them. This one here, right here. He's a bad culprit, unbelievably bad, because he's, he's at a point now that just about every known chemistry that they use to control ryegrass won't work. It's over with, school's out. You want to spray it, it's not gonna work. You gotta look at some other options to manage this weed, okay? Not good. This is the thing that does concern me as a weed scientist. You know, are we, uh, are we at risk of developing some kind of pretty significant problem with weeds? Well, we may be on the cusp. This is what resistance has showed up in the United States. We know ACCH resistance shows up in, and we have some in Kentucky. It's hold on resistance. ALS resistance shows up in Arkansas and Mississippi, and I'm, this is an old slide. We can now put Kentucky on the map. We've got it. So we got both ALS and ACCH resistance, and that's not good for, if you, if you grow wheat and you've got ryegrass, and you got both of those resistances, it's tough. I'll say just good luck, okay? ACCH and ALS resistance showed up in Georgia and in Arkansas, and then we've got this other type of three-way resistance in Idaho. This is the one that does concern me a fair amount. Uh, glyphosate resistance shows up in Oregon, Mississippi, and Arkansas. And I, I believe me, the guys in Mississippi and Arkansas are not real happy. Oregon too. Where do we get our, or yeah. I have a question. How about using like a summer cover crop or a winter cover crop to, or other cultural controls to help reduce resistance? for this weed or other weeds? Ryegrass or other weeds in general. Unbelievably, could you all hear this? I'll put you on the team here. <laughs> uh, she was asking about what well, using cover crops and help slow down the development of resistances, I think is what you're trying to say. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm gonna pick and choose my cover crops though, okay? Well, right, correct. <laughs> okay. Because ryegrass is being promoted as a cover crop yeah. in Kentucky and a lot of other grain crops areas is they're promoting ryegrass. And I can assure you my good weed science colleagues are not real happy about that because of this resistance showing up. Where do we get, and I'm gonna stay on ryegrass, but I'm gonna come back to your comment again. 
ryegrass. Where do we get ryegrass seed? Where do we buy it? 99% of the ryegrass seed that comes in Kentucky, where does it come from? Oregon. There you go. First resistance showed up? Oregon. Oregon. Does that tell you something? That says, that's not good. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Oregon. The, here's kind of the good news in that whole scenario, if there is such a thing as good news. Where it shows up in Oregon, the glyphosate resistance, it shows up in the orchards, as I said earlier. It's not in the seed production fields so far. As so far as we know. Okay? If it shows up, you know, and it may show up, I wouldn't doubt that someday it will. But, you know, I, I don't want to lambast the, the Oregon Seed, Ryegrass Seed Commission, because, you know, they're real sensitive to this, as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, ryegrass is being promoted as a cover crop. And we were, uh, my weed science colleagues and I are trying to say, hey, look, you know, what price do you want to pay? Yeah, ryegrass is a good cover crop. Mm -hmm. And if I had to say of any cover crop we can grow out there, I don't think there's any others that will com compare to ryegrass in terms of its capabilities of competing. Clover? I don't know. Clover? Not. No. Nah. I promise you, ryegrass will eat its lunch. Ryegrass is, it's a very, well, of all the annual weedy grasses that we have, it's, it's, it's really an aggressive, very aggressive. It comes out of the ground. You know what we do? Where do we use ryegrass? When we buy ryegrass seed, we sow it in the waterways because it, it's, it germinates and it establishes itself really fast. People love that. That is an advantage. You don't want to use a lot of ryegrass, if you, but you mix it with your fescue, and the real kicker is don't put a lot in there, otherwise you won't have any fescue because it'll just outcompete the fescue and it's done with. But a little bit of ryegrass gives you a real quick cover and let the fescue eventually come on because it's slow. It'll get there. And by the time the fescue gets there, the established ryegrass kind of dies out. But we sow it in the waterways, along the edges of the field borders, slopes, those kind of areas. But when it gets in the waterways, our grain crop guys, when they're out harvesting wheat, ryegrass matures about the same time the wheat does. So they get in the combine and they're blowing through the fields and they go across those waterways and they're not going to shut that grain head off. They're, they're too busy, man. They've they got a mission in mind. They're going to cross that waterway and they're going on down the field. And what are they doing? All that stuff coming out of the back of the combine is scattering it from one side and they come back again on the other side of the waterway and they have just done a great job of scattering ryegrass everywhere. And that's where it gets its toehold in our, in our row crops, okay? Um, okay, this is the last slide. Resistance, this is where we are in Kentucky. I said the mayor's tail, Italian ryegrass, Waterham and Palmer are the ones that really are a concern to us. I do want to, one other slide and I'll let you guys go. Uh, Lee Townsend kind of hinted at these numbers that are on pesticide labels and you may be familiar with this already, but companies are starting to get on board with this and trying to simplify the process because, you know, you don't need to be chemists. You've got enough things on your plate to have to worry about. Don't worry about, do I have to know what enzyme and what herbicide to use? If you know that the fact that their group are classified by numbers and glyphosate is by itself, it's a nine, right over here. Roundup Powermax. If you look on the jug, it's that number is assigned to the glyphosate and the types of chemistry it's associated with, it's a nine. If you take a related compound, Halix GT, it's got nine in it as well, but it's got something with a 15 and also it's a 27. One of them's a metolachlor or a dual, and the other one's a Callisto. Different modes of action. And that's where, you know, when we're trying to fight resistance is the encourage people is, hey, look, don't just use one chemistry and that's it. Don't go out and buy the, jo the jug of Power Max and nine on it. And that's, all, that's my program. If someone asks, what's your program? It's Roundup, Roundup, Roundup. Well, that's not a good program when it comes to trying to develop or limit uh, Roundup resistance. I'm done. I'm finished in time before you to eat. <laughs> I've enjoyed, thanks for putting up with me, and I hope uh, it's been good for you folks. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.